Welcome into the Yachts and Audibles podcast. Eric Scopel, Jared Mack here today, mailbag edition. I was uh, looking this up, Jared. Has it been like a couple of months since we've done one of these? I think I think the last one yeah. I saw was, was like December. <laughs> it was like December. Not, so yeah. we'll, uh figured we'd reopen the mailbag here now that uh, my brain's working again properly. Uh, we've got baseball to talk about, which is exciting. In fact, first half of the show will be the Jared Mack show. I will basically toss the question to him and let him cook. And then we'll get into some football and over the second half, kind of a, a wide range of, of football topics, but some kind of fun stuff. We had a lot of good question submissions this week. I'm sure folks have been anxiously waiting to get their questions in since it's been two, three months since we've done one of these. Um, but let's start with a question, as I hinted here, from uh, Theo Winter, who asks, with the 6-1 and one start to the season and coming up a four-game series sweep, how would you grade the Oregon baseball team thus far? Pitching, hitting, fielding. And then a follow-up question from him. Also, for those who aren't familiar with this team, as some of us are, who would you say the players are to watch for? Hashtag Ots and Audibles. Jared, the floor is mm -hmm. yours. Thank you. Well, to start, I must say I don't like doing the grades. Um, I, I really, really am not a fan of, of grading teams. Eric, I don't know how you do it every week with football. Um, uh, like I, hate, my, I hate doing it. I hate doing yeah, it. It's and, one of my pet peeves about this industry. And I'm not it's sure like, I will continue. Grade everybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't like doing that. Um, I will split it up, though, and talk about each three and, you know, pitching, hitting, and fielding. Uh, I'll get fielding out of the way first. Uh, it's been fine. I don't think there's any real reasons to worry. Um, you know, Jeffrey Hurd and Mason Neville, like, you know, misplayed a couple of balls in Texas. And Drew Smith has actually struggled. He's got, like, four errors in the early season so far. That's the one thing to monitor. But other than that, I think they're a fine fielding team. I don't think there's any worry there. Um, hitting is, you know, they swept Lafayette. Lafayette's a bad team. It's not like, hey, we, they swept Lafayette. Like, like, let's go celebrate. Like, yeah, it's no, it's always good to, to beat up on the bad teams. That's exactly what you should do as a good team. But, you know, I'm not going to sit here and act like they're the 27 Yankees with Murderer's Row anytime soon. But, it was encouraging because they got off to slow starts in Texas. Again, it was against much better competition in Oklahoma, Baylor, and Texas Tech. But, um, you know, they, they put up some big numbers. It's a different team than it was last season on the offense and obviously the pitching side. But offensively, you know, last year's team had a lot of guys who could strike for a three or three home, three run home run, two run home run. Then you get a solo shot. Like, there's power on the team, but I don't think they'll be able to do that as frequently. Um, I don't think any home run records are going to be in danger this year or something like that, unless there's unless somebody goes ballistic, but I don't really see it. Um, like on Friday in the first game of the series, you know, they scored five runs in an inning or six runs in an inning, and you know, four of them came off RBS singles and the other two were sacrifice flies. Like that's more or less what it's going to be like, and mm. which is good. You know, if they can get everybody hitting, that's all you really need. Um, you know, doubles, doubles at the gap, a couple home runs here and there. I know Bryce Betcher had one this week. Brian Cooney had two of them. Justin Casella had two of them. Like, it's there. Don't get me wrong, but it's just not as prevalent as it was last year. I, I do like the offense quite a bit. I think it'll come around um, as the season progresses. But it was it was encouraging. But again, Lafayette is not not great, Bob. Uh, and pitching, pitching's the surprise. Or. Mm -hmm. The surprise for people who who uh, who have watched Oregon teams in the past couple of years, because this is not a strong suit. There's like a couple of good pitchers every year, but um, Oregon this year has a lot of arms. Like a lot of guys who have potential. They got a lot of guys who have actual stuff right now. And you know, this is all without Isaac Aon, who's out for the season uh, with an elbow injury. You know, uh, Grayson Grinsell, Toby Twist, uh, Kevin Sider, R.J. Gordon, all of the starters this weekend. You know, I think they could play. I had this in one of my stories. It was 20 combined innings pitched between the four of them, uh, six earned runs total. So I think it was a 270 RA and then 30 strikeouts. And yep. uh, a lot of those came from uh, Grayson Grinsell and Kevin Sider, who combined for 22 or to be 21, uh, 10 for Grinsell, 11 for Sider. They're good. I, I think they're solid. I don't think they're there's any top of the line guy. There's no Robbie Allstrom from a couple of years ago. There's no, Hey, this guy's going to be a top two draft pick or a top two round draft pick in the upcoming draft, but they're good college pitchers. And then their bullpen is deep. Uh, they got options on both the, the right and left side. Um, you know, they have Brock Moore in the back end who hit a one one yesterday. They got Jackson Jordan as a junior college transfer, Michael friend, another junior college transfer. Um, I think the talent is certainly there pitching wise. I think that's the, 
biggest surprise compared to other years. Um, if you read all my preseason stuff, you'd know that this was clearly a strength going into the year and it's showcasing itself. So I'm happy about that. Um, it, there's just a lot of talent. I, didn't, I, after watching them in the fall and the spring, I just didn't know how it wasn't going to translate. There's just a lot of arm talent there. It, it, I'm happy you brought up that pitching stat from this past weekend because I had highlighted that to bring up because somebody who's followed it from afar, the, the pitching, at least from a starting perspective, has been kind of ups and down. But the fact that mm -hmm. you could have a 270 ERA across four starts over a weekend was probably a, a pretty encouraging sign. And as you said, Lafayette, not exactly world beater, is probably going to be better tests upcoming to kind of more define some of this improvement. But I'm, I'm sure you're encouraged. And I, I guess just to ask a follow up, how good was this stuff? Like, did, did, did like was this just Lafayette swinging willy nilly, or did you feel like Oregon's staff was was putting out some good stuff this weekend? No, I think it's good stuff. Um, I think Grayson Grinsell has great stuff. I don't, you know, he has he sits like eighty nine and ninety one with his fastball from the left side, but it's got late life on it. People are just always late on it, and you know, good slider, good curveball, throws in a changeup every once in a while, but. Same with Kevin Sider, just kind of good stuff. More of a location guy, and I think his strikeout numbers are a little inflated by Lafayette not being a great team. But um, And again, Toby Twist is a true freshman who I think has good stuff. And RJ has RJ has fine stuff. I, I sometimes worry about his swing and miss, um, mm. which is kind of illustrated by the fact that he had the lowest strikeout total of the weekend or tied for the lowest with Twist, I think it was. Um, but I think still think that he – is a good is an he's an old pitcher he's been around the block he knows what to do he fights he's never been like again like an elite strikeout number dude but he you know he fights for five to six innings and honestly like when you compare it to what they were starting last year like week three of the season where it was three true freshmen who uh frankly weren't as talented as the true freshmen are this year uh you know that it's a it's a big difference and i don't expect them to always have a 270 ra um, but what I do expect is that it's just more competitive. You know, Oregon will not, uh, it'll happen probably once or twice, but it will not happen on the same you know, uh, everyday occurrence, basically, where Oregon would get down and, and it would be like five or six to nothing after the second inning because of their pitching staff. So uh, that's, that's the encouraging part is you don't need the offense to be as awesome as they were last year because the pitching is, is significantly improved. Moving on to a second baseball question. We got a lot of baseball questions in this mailbag, which, again, was encouraging. I know Jared's poured a lot of effort into covering this program, and it's great to see people, uh, A, being excited. I know right now they're the most uh, successful program on this campus. If you look around, softball's kind of had an up-and-down start, men's and women's mm -hmm. basketball. Yeesh, the team I cover has not been very good. That's not been a lot of fun, but uh, it seems like there's a lot of excitement. So we're going to jump over to another question here on base with from baseball perspective from at Gilchrist. AR5. Okay. I think it's Gilchrist Car 5. Gilchrist Car 5. I think you're right. Okay. Yeah. That makes more sense. I was confused on what the AR could mean, but you know, I always try to figure out what these uh these handles stand for. He wants to know the strengths and weaknesses, and I know you've done some of this, Jared, for the Oregon baseball team after their first home series. And then this is the part I wanted to hit too. Expectations moving forward. Has your has the opening, because I know you were at all seven games, you're down in Texas. Watch them beat a couple of Big Twelve teams, lose to one. Um, has your has your I guess expectation shifted? And then if you have more on the strength and weaknesses you wanted to get into, yeah, expectations I think are the same for me. I thought this team was going to be good. Uh, I think that they didn't make any preseason polls, and that was okay uh, because they had a ton of question marks. You know, they lost seven of their nine starting guys in their lineup. Like no no preseason poll is going to rank them. It's right. not like college basketball where you, know, you lose two or three starters, but you return with three, five stars from the recruiting class or something like that. So it's like, Oh, we can rank them obviously. Duh. But um, you know, Oregon brought in talent, but it was still, you know, guys like Jeff Hurd or you know, uh, Justin Casella guys who played at Sac State and Elon. Like, yeah, they, they were good there, but are they good in the Pac-12? We're not sure. Yeah. So, but for me, just watching the team over the fall and over the spring, um, I just thought that they were good. I liked I liked the talent that they brought in. Um, the guys like Hurd and Casella, I watched their tape. I just liked their swings. They just seemed like professional hitters more than anything else. Where, you know, you 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 can take a flyer on guys in the portal sometimes, but these guys didn't really feel like flyers. They felt like there probably was a ceiling, but that ceiling was still like an everyday player who is impactful who can contribute immediately. So. 
I like the guys that they brought in, but the expectations I think are still like, you know, I think they're going to get to the postseason. Um, but then after that, it's just kind of, it's just kind of a crapshoot, like it is with March Madness. It's like you get to the tournament, and that's all you really want to do because if you get to the tournament at the right time with your team, you never know. It could be like Oregon State a couple of years ago where they go to the Elite Eight, and you, that's the, you know the farthest they've ever been in a tournament. Um, nobody could really explain why, but but it happened, and it happened last year with Oregon, where you know they really struggled towards the end of last season, and then turned it on against Utah, won the Pac-12 championship, won the Nashville Regional, got to a Super Regional, like just out of the blue. So, I think the expectations are obviously to get to the postseason. I think that they can accomplish that pretty easily. Um, the Pac-12 is going to be tough this year. I think a third place finish would be really, really good for them. I think Oregon State um, is by far and away the best team in the Pac-12 this year, but. For me personally, even though we're through seven games, I don't. My expectations haven't changed. I think they're just they're still in line with what I expect them to do, and we'll we'll see going forward. But um, like one of the weaknesses to go into that that I find with this team is the bottom of the lineup is just mm. there's some question marks. I really like Carter Garotti, who's who's on fire to start the year. I think they eventually will move him to the two hole. Um, in place of the like revolving DH spot that they've had it going the last couple of games. Um, but then you have Ryan Cootie, who showed good stuff against Lafayette, and then Bryce Betcher, who started the season hot. But once they get Pac-12 pitching or, you know, Santa Barbara this weekend, you know, we're going to find out if they're any good or not. Because Santa Barbara and Pac-12 pitching is usually some of the better in the country. Santa Barbara is still like a top 25 team this year. It's going to be It's going to be interesting because I think they've done really well off of Lafayette and I think they did well I think Betcher did really well in Arlington and Texas but we'll see like that that's one of the things they need Dominic Hellman to get going um if he gets going he can be you know, he has some of the best power in the country like he could be a really important part of that lineup uh, you know down like the six or seven hole if he can get going but that's one of the weaknesses I can see right now but um the more will pop up don't get me wrong. Like this is not a perfect team by any standard. Um, the more will pop up as the teams get better, but um, you know they, they again they took care of business. They did what they needed to do against a bad team. Ducks will be back at PK Park this weekend, a three game series against UC Santa Barbara. Uh, I'm going to lean into the fact that there's a football player on the team just for folks that are not diehard baseball fans. You can go to go watch as Jared said, Bryce Betcher, who's what's Bryce hitting to start the year? He's he's had a good start, right? No, oh, good question. Um, um, I'll look but that for, up real quick, but yeah, if you're a, if you're a diehard football fan, you know Bryce's name. He was a starting inside linebacker early on in the season, a couple of games there, and Jamal and and obviously Justin Jacobs kind of took over. But but Betcher's uh, a local kid who's who's playing on the team and, and playing really well. So uh, if you are a diehard football fan, maybe this is an introduction into Oregon baseball. If you want to go support Bryce uh, again, three games this weekend, starting on Friday against UC Santa Barbara. Bryce is hitting 409 to start the year. That'll so, work. Yep. He's got nine hits and 22 ABs. He hit a home run yesterday. Uh, has made two diving catches the last couple of days in center field. It's it's wild. He plays linebacker and then comes out and plays center field. Um, it's, and, and, it's a lot and, of fun uh, to watch him play. One of those was like a sports center top 10, I think, diving catch. Was it not from Bryce? Yeah, yeah, it was, but I actually thought his other one was better. It was like okay. the the top ten play was more like uh, more of a wow moment, but the second one was more of like, oh, this guy is a really good baseball player type of play. It was just like great read off the bat, no hesitation, just jumps on it, uh, makes a diving Superman hero or Superman catch in center. Like, I just thought it was more impressive. But then again, who who cares what I think? <laughs> people are listening to I mean, that's why they had all these questions yeah. for you for the baseball you know all right we're gonna hit a quick break we'll come back we'll talk a little football we got three questions on the other side talking Oregon Duck football all right back from the break as I, as I hinted on the other side we've got some football questions here um I thought it was kind of fun to to, to vary this so I tried to pick kind of three different types of questions you'll see what I'm getting at in a moment but we're going to start with a a transfer kind of recap question from at Bigfoot Actual. Um, who is your vote for most impactful non-quarterback transfer? Hashtag Ots and Audibles. I think this is the first time question from at Bigfoot. So appreciate you listening and jumping in here. 
thought this was kind of a fun one. I, I did a ranking um, of the most impactful newcomers on the team, which hint, hint, was almost exclusively transfers because transfers are almost always going to be more impactful than true freshmen. Mm -hmm. um, no surprise, I did have Dylan Gabriel number one. I think everybody should. Picking the next guy, Jared, is kind of tough. I had three candidates um, for the story, and I like waffled back and forth to pick it even at the time. And again, this was like two or three weeks ago. I landed on Jamari Caldwell, the Houston interior defensive line transfer. But I think mm -hmm. it was really hard to separate him, Jabbar Muhammad, and Evan Stewart, just because if you look at those three guys, all three very highly regarded in the 24-7 sports transfer portal rankings have had quite a bit of success at past schools um, and also play positions of great need. I thought the, the kind of the differentiator for me, and again, there's no wrong answers in my question because I think all three of these guys are, are perfectly good answers. And maybe Jared will pick someone not on this list, so that would be fun to talk about. But, uh, yeah, didn't think so. I think it's kind of clear you're picking, you're picking from one of these through. Why I landed on Caldwell was, A, I think he's really, really good. And B, this is the point we've made, and I know Jared's kind of led the train on this, is if you don't add a guy like Caldwell, you're relying on redshirt freshmen, sophomores, and true freshmen. The other positions that wouldn't necessarily be the case, like if Jabbar Muhammad wasn't added, Oregon still had already taken Cam Alexander. And even if you take him out of the equation, it's like Dante Manning is at least a guy who's been playing for four years. I know that there's varying returns on what people think of his game, but like he's got experience. He started – I think half a dozen games probably in his career at Oregon now. Um, if Evan Stewart, you know, if he wasn't here, you'd be looking at probably just Treshawn or Gary or some sort of some. I don't know you maybe get creative and find a way to make that work, perhaps. Um, so that's why I went with Shamari. I think these players are all pretty similar. I think obviously Evan Stewart has the highest NFL draft ceiling, and again, I'm not going to be surprised if he leads the team in receiving. But um, I went with Caldwell. Jared, where did your head go here? Because I think, it, like I said, I think you could kind of go one of three different directions pretty easily. Yeah, I think those are the top three, though. Um, I, I'm going to go with Muhammad just because you pick Cal Caldwell, and I don't really sure. like – I think I think Caldwell is, like, probably the most important for all the reasons you just mentioned. And, like, you know, they need a lot of interior defensive linemen, and he's going to be the best one of the bunch. Um, but for Muhammad – I he's going to be most impactful, but he's certainly not like the most important transfer they landed. Like Muhammad almost felt like, hey, we can get this guy. Mm -hmm. Like this is a luxury purchase, and because Cam Alexander's a good corner, uh, you know, Oregon has taken a lot of cornerbacks in the last couple a couple of recruiting cycles who are really talented, like Rod Pleasant, Dalen Austin, Siona Laulea, um, Dakota Fields, Ifeopa Dagwu. Like those are five dudes I just named who. You know, on um, on probably ninety five percent of the teams in the country, they would have somewhat of a role, whether it's a starter, whether it's a, an immediate backup. But Oregon was just like, you know what? We can get Jabbar Muhammad, who gave us nightmares last year in the Pac twelve mm -hmm. championship game against Troy Franklin, and had given Texas nightmares, who gave Michigan nightmares, who gave a lot of Oregon State. He had two picks there. We're gonna get him. Screw it. We're going to get him. And they did. And he's going to be incredibly impactful on the field. He's a lockdown cover corner. You know, I'm interested who they're going to be playing opposite of him, whether it's Dante, whether it's Cam Alexander or one of the younger guys I mentioned. But, um, you know, you can pen him in. There's no pencil needed. As long as he's healthy, you can pen him into the starting 11 on defense. And, you know, he's going to, against these Big Ten offenses, like – he can pretty, you know, I, I, unless he's going against Ohio State in October, I feel like I'm pretty confident saying that he can really lock down one side of the field against whoever he's covering. I don't, there's not as elite of wide receiver talents in the Big Ten as there was in the Pac 12 the last couple of seasons. And so to have him and Alexander and Manning and all the guys I mentioned, it's a good start. And I think he's going to be incredibly impactful, but I do think Caldwell is like the more impactful guy. Like he, he needs to be the more impactful guy as well. To your point that you made there briefly, can you imagine if Oregon was in the Big Ten this last year and they faced not only Adunze and Polk and McMillan, but also Marvin Harrison Jr. and yeah. a couple of Apuka and all those guys over at Ohio State, probably forgetting some of Ohio State's receivers because there's so many damn good ones. Like that would have been, and I know Oregon also faced like, premier quarterback play, but just to, to face Marvin Harrison Jr. along with the Dunes, who are two of the top three receivers off the board in the NFL draft this upcoming year, that would have been a challenge. And I actually had – I want to go slightly off script here. 
I'm kind of surprised that Caldwell back to him, and this is also part of the reason I, I picked him, because it's they've kind of I figured I figured they'd take more interior defensive linemen. Um, that was something we talked yeah. about. The fact that they've only taken one almost makes his his value increased because it's like if this doesn't work out, to my point earlier, there's not really a lot there from an experience perspective. I think we're all really high on some of the individuals, but I don't know. I, I, I'm still surprised. I know there's room after spring to maybe add one or two, but you know, I think we talked about three to five to seven or something like that. And I think it's probably going to be closer to two or three at most, which is mm-hmm. putting a lot of trust in this younger group of guys. So obviously the Tony Tuyoti and Tosh are confident in the young guys, but I'm, I'm, I'm myself surprised that it's just been called well from an interior perspective so far in the portal. Yeah, same here. Um, for, for all the reasons you mentioned, like, you know, this is a situation where you just you just trust the staff because, you, like, they're obviously not going to be negligent in this situation. Um, some coaching staffs might be or just might not have the resources. Uh, Oregon is not one of those staffs. They've shown for years now, especially under Dan, that uh, same with Muhammad, like, hey, we got the resources to get this kid. He's going to be an absolute immediate addition and impactful. Like, all right, let's go get him. And that's what Dan has shown for, you know, the three, the two and a half, the three years that he's been here. He's like, if there's a kid that, you know, they want to go and get, they're going to go their their damnedest to try to go and get him. So, I I, I really am surprised that it's only one dude. Um, you have to trust the staff and Tony and Tosh, like you said, Eric, and like it, it trust their evaluations of how impactful. Guys like Amari Washington, Jericho Johnson, Aiden Breland, uh, you know, Ben Roberts, like all those guys can be in the interior because compared to what it was last year where there was a lot of upperclassmen, Doralis, Casey Rogers, and Taki Taimani, Popo Amavai, like those are some hard replacements. And you know we'll see eventually, but it, it is surprising, but it does increase Caldwell's value. Plus Caldwell is – so different than any interior offensive lineman that Oregon has had. Like he resembles statistically more like what Brandon Dorless did, but he does mm-hmm. not resemble Brandon Dorless on the field because he is way bigger than Brandon Dorless ever was. And that's that's saying a lot because Brandon Dorless did get up there under Mario. He got up there in size and then kind of cut when Dan came back. But you know, Caldwell is, is listed at 325. I don't think Brandon ever got close to that. No, and I think the funny thing with Brandon, this actually transitions us nicely into the next question, which is into the NFL draft. Brandon's also dropped like 20 pounds since leaving Oregon, according to the Senior Bowl, where he was weighing in at, what, like 270 or something, which was sort of yeah, surprising. He was, he, I'm going to look it up, but I think he was like 276 or something like that. Yeah, I listened to a couple of draft podcasts that were kind of like, this is, I don't know if this is the right choice for him, just because they, they thought he had a little more versatility if he was able to play closer. 272. Yeah, that's a that's a skinny Brandon Dorless. He was playing here mm-hmm. closer to 290, and to your point, under Mario, maybe even a little more than that. So uh, anyway, I thought that was kind of an interesting note. Now we can transition to this draft question from at Nash underscore Duccaneer. Where do your 2024 mock drafts have former Ducks going? I think JPJ and Troy Franklin go in the first round. I could see Bo Nix early in the second. What are your thoughts? Hashtag thoughts and audibles. Um, I don't make a mock draft, so this isn't going to be my mock draft. This is going to be the podcast I listens to, the, the all the fun mock drafts that I read throughout the course of the week. I know Jared is our mock draft guy on the website. Not that he creates mock drafts, but that he posts kind of the updates on the, re- the recent movement. So I figured we could have a conversation about what we've been reading slash hearing, not what our actual assessments are, because just want to be clear that we're not NFL draft experts. I have a lot of respect for people who do that stuff because they're grinding and watching a lot more film than I ever would probably allow myself to watch. Um, but I thought we could just do like a quick rundown of some of these names and kind of what we've been seeing. Uh, I just wanted to start with JPJ because it seems like he's been mm-hmm. the biggest mover from the senior bowl. He was kind of going into that, Jared, I think is like maybe a second round pick. And I've seen almost a consensus of first since that which is and actually i'm not going to be surprised if he would be the first duck taken off the board i kind of expect it now which certainly wasn't yeah. the case when i thought the season ended because i would have thought that would have been troy but uh you kind of look at the mocks i've seen jpj over troy and Bo has kind of been a weird one we can talk about that one in a second are you yeah. with me that jpj feels like maybe the most surefire 
first round or the first duck taken, at least right now. And I know this is really hard because there's a ton of different factors, but does that seem like a fair representation? Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Um, he's been in like the mid to late teens and like the most recent like post senior bowl mock drafts. And I think it's just because he's young, he's experienced, he has exactly the size that you're looking for in an interior guy. He loves football. He just goes out there and tries to you know, obliterate anybody he can. We've all seen it in his downfield blocks and his blocks at the line of scrimmage. Um, yep. Like, I don't love taking a center in the first round because it's a center, but um, he has positional versatility. And I think that really, really helps his draft stock because not only is he a first round center, but he's probably a first round guard too. And I like him more at center. I'm, probably just because that's what I've seen him play the most at. But I have very little doubt that if you were an NFL team and you needed to move JPJ to guard, I think that he would be just fine, if not very, very good there. So I think he's a first-round pick. I, I'm, I'm pretty darn surprised about it for the reasons I mentioned about a center. Like, it's not a very mm -hmm. valuable position. Usually teams do not try to do that. They take the valuable guys first, which we'll get into with Bo and my argument for him. Yep. Um, and, it, like, it's... I don't know. Like he could be a top eighteen pick. Like I think at, at like the peak, he could maybe. Yeah. I, I've seen him a lot to like Pittsburgh Steelers. Where I've seen yeah, exactly. Yeah, Pittsburgh. Uh, like one or two times, like Denver. A lot of times to the Dolphins, which I think would be a lot of fun. Mm. But I think that yeah, like to go back to your original point after my ramble, like he should be the, the of of the Oregon players, like the dude to be the the first round pick. And it's just to say on it for a second, what a crazy like year he's had. I mean, you think about this, the conversations we were having last year around this time where Alex Forsyth is gone. What's the situation at center? We were confident he'd be good. I don't think anybody thought he'd turn around and win the Remington and be a first round draft pick. I mean, it, especially because it, it gets overlooked how infrequently offensive linemen are three and done, at least from an Oregon perspective. I don't know how many you have other than like Penne did it, obviously. And Penne was like kind of like almost like a, Two and he was done, a two and done. The way that worked he was out, a one and a half. Yeah, the way that hurt his freshman year. That was unfortunate, but like you just, you just don't see it happen very often, is my point. So for JPJ to do it, uh, major kudos to him. Uh, certainly will be a JPJ fan over here. He's like he's a great guy. I love talking with him and, and, and interacting with his family. So that's just a cool one. And then let's move to Troy, who I've seen kind of the consensus seems to be like last five picks of the first, maybe first ten picks of the second. Seems like he's. People like him as a first round pick kind of depends on the fit with mm -hmm. the teams. I would love to see him with the bills or the chiefs, which are two, um, I would say more common landing spots that I've seen just because that would be matching up with two of the best quarterbacks in the NFL and on teams that are ready to be pretty damn good. Obviously the chiefs being the defending champs and we know what the bills are. They're uh, going to find a way to lose a heartbreaker in the playoffs every year, but probably win 10, 11 games. So, um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, Troy, I, you, I, I think that's kind of where it's at right now. I, I think there were some fans from an Oregon perspective that were thinking he could creep into that a Adunze kind of range, but it seems like there's a, a top three with, with Marvin Harrison Jr., Adunze, and then uh, Neighbors from LSU is kind of the consensus top three. And Troy is kind of that fourth or fifth guy, and, and that sort of is the range of that back of the first, I think. Yeah, Troy is kind of unlucky. Because this is a really good wide receiver group. And like you said, Eric, it's Harrison, Neighbors, and Adunze. And then uh, Brian Thomas, the other LSU receiver, Adonai Mitchell out of Texas. Lad McConkey had a really good week, apparently, at the Senior Bowl. Like, there's just some good dudes. Like, I know Lad McConkey is like, yeah, you know, he's just Slot, like the, slot guy. The, Slot guy from Georgia, like, of, of course, like, he's not going to do anything. He's, he's good. He's a great route runner. He's got great footwork. Like, someone's going to take him. It's going to be – I don't know. It's probably going to be a second rounder or, or a third rounder, but he's going to be an impact guy like day one. Um, but for Troy, yeah, I'd love to see him go to Kansas City or, or Buffalo. Like, those are teams that need a guy like him. Um, yeah. We all saw the Chiefs in the Super Bowl, and if you watched them over the course of the regular season, they all had, they had, he, they had legitimate trouble with vertical threats. And you know that's what Troy Franklin is great at. He's a vertical threat. He's six six. He's one hundred eighty five, one hundred ninety five pounds. Like he can he can bulk up. He's got the frame to do it. Um, I, I think that in the NFL, he's going to be tested. That he needs to figure out how to run the routes that aren't vertical. 
Um, but I think he's talented enough that that's not going to be that big of an issue. Um, I, I know that that's kind of been like a knock on him in the NFL draft is like, dude just ran straight verticals like all the time at Oregon. But he had he has a he has a deeper bag than that to put it yeah, in, he does. in normal day culture terms. Like he can he can go out there and run whatever you need. And if he goes to the Chiefs, like I think that's a perfect spot for him at the end of the first round. I think that's kind of like his not not that thirty two is his ceiling, but the end of the first round is his ceiling, and that's yeah. mostly because of the other wide receivers that are in this draft. Like you didn't think that Malik Neighbors going into the season was going to be like one of the first two wide receivers taken, but boy is he because he's incredible. Um, but Troy is also very very good. He's just on that second ledge. He's just not up at the top tier with a dude Zay neighbors and Harrison jr. And that's fine because he would be, if he gets picked at 32, I think he would be the highest drafted Oregon wide receiver ever. Unless you mm-hmm. want to say Ahmad Rashad was a wide receiver. Yeah, he kind of wasn't though. And that was also right. like my dad was in like growing up when not to, not to date Ahmad too much, but like that's been 50 plus years. Um, right. More, Those aren't, that's that. not a, what a, what a receiver is now. So, right. If he was a first rounder, that'd be Oregon's first ever first round receiver. I'm really curious to see what he runs in the forty. You know, yeah, I think I, that I, could make or break could, the first round right? candidacy. Yeah, you know, and that could even like if he comes out and actually runs a time no one expects. Like, I, I, I really don't know what he runs. I'm so bad at predicting forties. I know against USC he ran like a slant route and and ran made, made I think it was uh, Will one of the Williams brothers for for USC looked really silly and he just flew past mm-hmm. him and then you're going like okay that looks like legit four four type speed but I'll be very curious to see what he runs there maybe he runs faster than people think and and he moves up maybe he moves up a little bit but um I I think it would be really fun if he lands with one of these teams that are real contenders right away that need receivers like think about if Troy Franklin was out there running the vertical routes instead of you know Valdez Scantling and Justin Watson right. and all these yeah. guys like Troy's just a better talent than those guys, and that would be, I think, an awesome landing spot. Okay, Bo, which is the most interesting, probably the three mentioned, and I do want to get into a couple of the other names that are, are going to be, you know, day two or, or earlier day three picks as well. But um, Bo early in the second is, I think, where people think he is from a talent perspective, but it really, to me, comes down to the quarterback needs, right, Jared? Like, if a team needs a quarterback, he might end up going to – Denver at like what pick thirteen or whatever I can't remember exactly where Denver picks I've just I've just yeah, seen them mock there 13, a couple of something like yeah that, somewhere yeah. in that range so that's what it comes down to because it seems like the consensus is pretty clearly there's a, a top three which will probably go right at the top of the draft with Caleb Williams with Drake May um, and with Jaden Daniels and then JJ McCarthy who I know Oregon fans don't think much of and I don't know what Jared's opinion is he's kind of snuck in there as the kind of the consensus number four. And then it's it's but kind of Bo and Penix, I think, is the next guy. So um, if there are five or six quarterbacks taken in the first round, Bo will go in the first round. But if there are fewer than that, he's probably going to go in the second. Well, it's a weird thing. And the position of the, the value of quarterback, obviously, is the greatest. And I don't think there's any, any position in a lot of sports that are more valuable than a good quarterback. And the other thing in the NFL draft is if you're a first rounder, you get a fifth year option. Right. And so that's going to be the difference maker. If somebody in the back end of the first round needs a quarterback, needs a backup quarterback, wants to take a flyer on a quarterback like Bo Nix, they're going to take them in the first round. It's going to be that simple. Mm -hmm. Like they're going to get the fifth year option instead of only having four years of options on a quarterback. And, you know, if he's great, obviously you pick it up. If he stinks, you just decline it. It's kind of, it's easy, but you have the option. And so, that's why I think Nick will sneak into the first round. He's going to throw to combine. Um, Field Yates, I think it was reported that last night that he'll throw in the combine. So that's good. Um, he, it didn't seem like he was the best at the senior bowl. It didn't seem like any quarterback was very good at the senior bowl other than Spencer Rattler, which was hilarious, but you know, good for Spencer. Um, so we'll, we'll see eventually. Like, I just don't know. I don't know if he'll go that like twelve to fifteen range. I don't like JJ McCarthy. I've just ha- I just haven't seen it from him. I just don't. I watched a good amount of Michigan games. We all watched the college football playoffs. I don't. I just never saw it from him. 
I know that he's physically, you know, built like a Greek god, has all the traits traits that you need. He's a younger guy than uh, almost every quarterback in this class, especially with you know old men like Michael Penix and Bo Nix. But I don't get it. But he's clearly, like you said, Eric, he's moved in that number four role. And I don't know how. I don't really see it. I don't get the arm strength. I don't get the decision making. I don't get a lot of it. I when you, I don't know. I, I don't get it. Well, but it's just I me. keep. I keep, well, I feel the same way, and it's funny because I, I admittedly I watch way more Oregon football, way more West Coast football, just because you know, those are the teams we're covering. And but I have watched more Michigan just to, to get a feel for them. A because they won the national championship, but B because that's a future conference member. And I, I, I didn't really remember watching a lot of like wow moments from JJ McCarthy. But then you listen to people talk about him, and they're like, oh yeah, he had these incredible throws in this Week Four game against so and so. And I'm kind of going like, hey, well, maybe I'm just watching the wrong games. But I, I really didn't see it for JJ. Not to make this a JJ McCarthy podcast. I have been surprised though that he has pushed Bo and Penix kind of down the pecking order given uh, what I had seen. And I still am kind of confounded by. I know Penix, some of it's medical, some of it's because he's had injury history. But he's he's got such an incredible arm. If if you were a team to take him in the second, similar to Bo, I'd be like. That's that's pretty dang good value there. Um, I want to touch on three more guys who I think have a chance to go day two, perhaps, which would be running back mm-hmm. Bucky Irving, Brandon Dorless in the corner, Kyrie Jackson. I mean, I'm not leaving anybody off that we should talk about, right, Jared? There's not like a, anyone else. In that no, not on day two. Like, you know, like guys like Casey Rogers, Evan Williams, or Popo maybe get picked up in the sixth and seventh round, kind of like what Jordan Riley was last year, but day two guys now. So Bucky... Doralis and Kyrie, um, it seems like from what I've seen, and again, a lot of the mocks I look at are first round mocks. They don't really go into the second and third, but it seems like Bucky has a little bit more juice in part because I don't think it's a very good running back class. And I think he's seen as one of the top four guys or so in that, in that group. Um, do you agree? He's probably the fourth or is it just fourth duct taken? I should say, or is it just a coin flip when you're getting into what teams want in that part of the draft the teams going to maybe prioritize positional needs over talent, but it seems like Bucky, because he plays a position where there's just not a lot of depth this year, it's not as good of a running back class. seems like he's been penciled in a little above some of the other guys, and at least the few that I've looked at. Yeah, I can see it. I, I think it'll be doorless because he just plays a more valuable position. Um, you know, I've talked about it a couple of times in this podcast. I don't running backs are running backs. They are replaceable, and I don't – like I would never spend a first-round pick on a running back or probably even a second-round pick. So uh, I think Bucky will be a day-two pick. I think he'll be a good running back in the NFL level. I'm, I'd be very surprised if he wasn't just based off his frame and his play style. Um, but I think Dorless is the more likely of the two to go, and that I think that's more of like um, – I don't, I, like I'm not saying I've seen that everywhere and I haven't seen it on like big boards or anything like that in terms of their rankings. I just think that that's maybe just how it's going to go after the combine. Um, mm-hmm. He's a really productive player in his couple of years of Oregon. Like the stats don't show it from an interior guy, but he was, he's been awesome for every year that he's played here. Um, and I just think that that's going to translate more to the NFL. Um, I think that he's just a more valuable player and Kyrie Jackson could Go on top of both of them, like yes. I, if he if he performs really well at the combine, like in his like obviously the measurements are already done at the Senior Bowl, but you know if he runs something in like the four low four fours at the forty or even gets below that, like six three cornerback who can run four fours, like it's pretty good. I don't know, it's pretty good. I would take that on my team. I think the exciting thing if you're an Oregon fan going into this draft is the odds are very high. Six ducks go in the first two days. Um, I don't think that's a lock. Sometimes guys drop, but we mentioned the other three, which APJ, Franklin, and Nix, but there's a second tier of ducks who are also going to be taken. And then as Jared said before, I think there's up to eight or nine guys who could go in this draft. And I, I don't know if there's too many after that, um, but what did we say that I, I, I should have looked this up. What did we say the record was for most players drafted Six. by ducks? Six. They're gonna oh, break it. Seven. Yeah, they're gonna break it because Evan Williams is, I think, a lock to be drafted. I think there's a lot of reasons to expect Casey and Popo to probably be taken as well. Um, maybe, maybe Stephen Jones at the very, very end, just because they're like this guy's well, a big, experienced yeah. offensive lineman. Like I could see a team feeling like he's a fit for you know as a run blocker. Um, there's guys is what I'm bringing up. 
Yeah, there's talent. Like Stephen Jones is kind of like the Jordan Riley of last year, where you know it's like, oh, like you've got the notification of his draft, you're like, man, why is he drafted? And you're like, oh yeah, he's ginormous. Yeah, he's ginormous and he's athletic and he can fill up space. And on a third and one, that sounds pretty good to me. So Stephen Jones could be that. Like he need, he'll need to um, try to get as athletic as he can and to to deal with nfl level uh, you know defenders but he's huge he's six foot seven he's like been the biggest guy in the team for like the last three years so i can see it um but yeah i think they're gonna break that record pretty easily uh i'm surprised it's only six but and that was you know six guys got taken last year i think it was so it's like it's been tied like all these times yeah i guess i'm a little surprised too i just also know that the, the oregon from a talent perspective is and maybe this is just a good thing to acknowledge like this is these are really talented rosters compared to past Oregon teams like the fact yep. that Oregon could have six players taken in the first three four rounds is like that's that's pretty unusual for Oregon I'm not unusual that's record-breaking that's a big difference from mm -hmm. not long ago where like Oregon has had this run of they, they almost always have a first round pick or they have over the last half decade and even over the course of the last decade I think if you were to look through it they probably have had I don't know in the last 10 years seven first round picks something like that I probably should have done this research before we jumped on but there's been a lot um yeah. it's just they haven't typically had the depth going through the rest of it and th right. this is what this is what the change is under Dan Lanning and I think I'm not going to be surprised at all if we based upon how they're recruiting these blue chip kids, if they develop and development's been really good under Dan Laning and the use of the portal has been really good. And we're talking about players that are going to be drafted, but half these guys, more than half these guys are of the top six are portal players. Like, I think you're going to see Oregon break and re-break this, this NFL draft record probably over and over, assuming Dan sticks around for the long haul, like he's talked about. The weird thing is that there's not like a top 10 overall prospect coming out of this class. Right. Like the last couple of years, it's been, you know, KT, Herb, Panay Sewell, like guys who were really flirting with that, or Christian Gonzalez, at least, like, was a little bit, like, kind of considered mentioned up there in that, like, top 10 range. Like, they don't have one of those guys this year, which is surprising because the guys who are coming out are all uber talented. And, yep. but they're just, it's like more of the positional thing. It's like, this is the NFL draft. This is not like, hey, these guys are really good in college. They're going to fit really well in the NFL draft. It's, this is the NFL. Like we're going to take what we think is the right right decision here. But I think they're going to break it. And like you said, I think um, this will just be a yearly thing as long as Dan sticks around and keeps recruiting, keeps showcasing that he can he can do the thing. NFL Combine coming up really shortly. Oregon's own pro day this week. Like, is it, yeah, the, the, yeah, it's all coming. We're we're going to be talking a lot of draft trips. I figured this would be a good kind of introduction to that. We're going to wrap up with a question from at Prince Puddles. Um, who asks, it definitely seems like Jordan James is a favorite to be RB1 going into next season, but would it be a stretch to think that no Whittington could have a Kenyon Barner type breakout season this year after waiting behind Bucky? Hashtag Ots and Audibles. Thank you, Prince Puddles. Thanks for all five question asters for putting this together. A lot of good stuff. We will, as I said earlier, won't have another two, three month break in between these. Um, so, I thought this was interesting because I wanted to actually get into something bigger picture, but my just gut answer to this is, is I do think it's a stretch um, to think that Noah's going to have a breakout season like Barner in part because let's just be real about it. Barner had an incredible season statistically, but he was really the only guy who they relied upon. And that's just not how Carlos Laughlin operates. So I don't see anybody having a breakout season like Kenyon Barner because, frankly, Bucky Irving didn't have a breakout season like Kenyon Barner. If we're just talking about total statistics, um, and I also really just don't know if I expect Noah to outperform Jordan to the point where he is RB one. Um, now, is it possible? Absolutely. And I was encouraged. I think there were uh, practice videos that the school put out in one of their videos recently that, that showed Noah cutting and going through some workouts. I don't know if he's full go, but it was encouraging because again, I'd heard when he was injured back in late September that that was, he tore some ligaments. Like he, he jacked that thing up pretty good. Um, that's encouraging. That I think it, that kind of indicates he's probably by the end of spring at the very least is going to be full go. Maybe before that, maybe he's day one ready, but um, that's an encouraging thing. And maybe that removes some of that concern about his injury, but I, I still like Jordan over Noah. Um, 
I'll let you go. And then I, I just had a bigger picture thing I wanted to jump into from, from a run game perspective. No, you're good. Um, yeah, no, I don't think it's happening. Like, I really like Noah Whittington, and I think he's going to be a really good number two back, just like he had been for Bucky Irving. I think, excuse me, Oregon really missed him last year. Mm-hmm. I think it's a it's an under like an underlying story of the season is like Noah Whittington was such a significantly better pass blocker than Bucky Irving was or Jordan James was. Like against Washington, that became a real problem, especially in Seattle. Um, you know, they would they would send extra heat, and Bucky just wouldn't pick up a guy. Or would get bowled over, you know, whatever the case may be. Like I think that was a significant issue uh, towards the end of last season. But I think Whittington's great. I really like him. He's just not yeah. going to be the number one running back, and it's going to look, you know, assuming Jordan James is who we think he is, I think it'll look very, very similar to what Oregon looked like in 2022 when Bucky was number one and Noah was number two. Like he still put up like 800 yards at the ground. It's not like he was slacking or anything like that. So, uh, and that's fine. I think he he could he could be the number two running back and still get like drafted. Like I th- I, th- I think he's that talented to be a guy who's like a late round pick. But Jordan Davis is the dude, and to he's not going to get close to Kenyon Barner numbers. That's just not how it works anymore. That that last part exactly what I wanted to get into because I looked up the 2012 Kenyon Barner season, and you have to remember, and this is I think important to talk about just big picture offense. This is 2012 team. Again, one of the best Oregon teams ever. They averaged 53 rush attempts per game. <laughs> he ran for 1,767 yards, which is still, I think, third on the all-time list. He had 21 touchdowns, which is right near the top. Like It was one of the best rushing seasons in program history. He also carried the ball 22 times per game. That just doesn't happen with Oregon football. And like Just to put it into context, in 2023, this last year, Bucky and, and Kenyon had – identical rush yards per carry average 6.34 um for buck i guess not quite identical 6.33 for Kenyon. so very very close but bucky has still only ran for 1180 yards and 11 touchdowns i say only because i just read the numbers that Kenyon ran through back in 2012 and it's a significant chunk more so i i just think yeah. we're not going to see a lot of like 1500 plus rushers come through oregon with the way that they're playing football right now you know, they, they, they averaged as a team 31 attempts this last year on the ground. You get Kenyon averaged 22 himself in 2012. So um, I just wanted to kind of like, I, I know that I don't know if that was exactly what the question was trying to get at in terms of the statistical. I probably wasn't. I just thought it was an opportunity to kind of take a beat and say, what Oregon's doing offensively is so different from what they were doing before. And for some, that might be really obvious. But just from a statistical perspective, I think that puts it into context of like, they're running it about 20 times fewer per game now than they were in the heart of kind of that Chip Kelly to Mark Helfrich era where it really was a, a spread run zone read kind of operation. Yeah. They still run at a lot of those same things, but from a pure numbers uh, quantity perspective, they're not even close to touching it. I mean, they, again, they're averaging about 20 fewer rushes per game now than back then, which is even though what Bucky has had these two great seasons, I think Bucky is a top six top seven running back in program history. I haven't gone through the exercise entirely to, to know where to place him, but he still, his best year was less than 1200 yards. Yeah. It's, it's just how college football is. Like there were five dudes who ran for over 1500 yards this year. And uh, Ollie Gordon led them all. And he had a hundred more carries than, than Bucky Irving did. So I think a hundred more carries for Irving, he'd probably get to that number, but um, I quickly looked it up in 2012 you know, 11 dudes ran for over 1,500 yards. So, yeah. like, literally dub- double the amount. And the leader was Kadeem Carey, a little Ooh. Arizona legend, who ran for 1,900 yards on 303 carries. So, <laughs> that's 20 more than Ollie Gordon did at Oklahoma State. And that's, you know, 400 more y- or 200 more yards, excuse me, 6.4 yards a carry. Like, college football just isn't going to run it as often in 2023 as it did in 2012. So, not to completely destroy the idea of this question, but um, sorry. Well, I, I get the point, and I, I know he. I don't think he was saying like, "Is could Noah Whittington run for eighteen hundred yards?" But I also went. I just just to go through the exercise of comparing like what it would take for someone to do that. My reaction was, "Yeah, it's just not going to happen." I just don't see Oregon having a fifteen hundred rusher unless they really, really find a special, special running back who is 
I don't know, a, a B. John Robinson. I'm just picking Jameer Gibbs these last couple of years who were first round great talents. I, I just don't. And even then, those guys, I don't think ran for anywhere near those kind of stats. So um, it's a different era of college football. I thought that was an opportunity to talk about kind of how things have changed over the last decade. Again, as Jared said, really like Noah Whittington. I think he has a chance to probably match what he did in 2020 to pre-injury obviously um but mm -hmm. i still lean jordan as the guy and who knows we'll get into spring here which is going to get underway not too long from now um and maybe we'll have very very different opinions and, and maybe noah will come out and be like oh he's the class of the position but i i don't necessarily expect that'll be where things wind up all right jared we have any parting thoughts here from this one that was all the questions we had thanks guys for asking um anything else uh the, you know, the only thing i have is uh army is hiring peyton yagi as a special teams analyst. So shout out wow. Peyton, former Oregon long snapper, uh, pride and joy of the media walk-ons. Um, so very, very happy for him. I think that, I think his playing here did predate the walk-on draft though, as I recall. Well, it's not that we didn't like walk-ons before a certain time frame. We it's just, true. you know, have a draft and, or not have a draft. That's good for Peyton. He just recently finished his time here, too. So he's probably. He was the than, Nevada special teams coordinator last year. I was going to say he's probably like 24, I would guess. Yeah. So good for Peyton. Got to like it. Maybe uh, maybe he'll become Oregon's next. I know some fans would love a new special teams coordinator not to go down that rabbit hole, which we won't because it's ridiculous. But uh, good for Peyton. All right. Uh, this has been a fun episode, I think, of the mailbag. I think we're going to try to do this, as I said before, far more frequently. I'm not sure it'll be next week, but. A Monday coming up here, maybe one of the, uh, you know, sometime in March, second Monday in March, who knows, we will see. But for Jared Mack, this has been Eric Scopel signing off from the Yachts and Audible's podcast. Talk to you later, folks.